Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar. Um, if this is your first time on the Medics Money webinar, especially warm welcome to you. My name is Dr. Tommy Perkins, and I'm one half of Medics Money. I'm a GP. Uh, the other half of Medics Money is my colleague, Dr. Ed Cantello, who's also a doctor uh, and a chartered accountant and chartered tax advisor. So uh, we're going to get started uh, on the webinar really, really soon. Uh, tonight, we're talking about investing. And this is something that I'm really passionate about because I was fortunate enough about 10 years ago for someone to sit me down and tell me a solid way to invest and grow my money. And I've never regretted that. Uh, so we're going to start telling you tonight about how to get started with investing. And we're also going to tell you about a product that can allow you to start investing right now and guide you through the whole process. And so I'm really excited about that. So um, if this is the first time, um, it will be great if everybody could jump into the chat, which is just over there. Um, Ed lives in the chat, so don't let Ed get lonely because he will be lonely in there. He's actually on call today and um, maybe some of you have been on call as well. Uh, and he's just about to jump in the chat now. Uh, so say hi to Ed. But one thing that would be great for us is to know um, what kind of doctor you are and where you are and maybe one thing that you're looking to learn tonight. So jump in the chat and um, we'll get going in there. And then I'll uh, introduce tonight's guest uh, in a minute once everyone's in and seated. So I'm gonna jump in the chat for a bit and introduce myself. So hi, Olivia. Um, yeah, this is exactly for you, looking how to invest and how you can make money grow. That is definitely. Uh, Angelica, clinical fellow in nuclear medicine. That sounds awesome. Uh, Sean, Joseph, we've got loads of people in here tonight. This is great. Um, Karina, Vishal, hi. Hi, Vishal. And Mark, we've got a few fellow GPs in there. Always good, but everybody's welcome. Um, the other thing I was going to say is, as I say, if this is your first time, welcome. We're doing these webinars. Uh, well, we're doing two this week, uh, but we're doing about two or three a month. Uh, you might have also heard our podcast. So if you've heard our podcast, definitely let me know uh, how you are getting on with that and if there's anything you want us to cover. Uh, and I don't know how you found us, whether it was via the ebook or the downloading the tax guide or probably your colleague told you about us. But however you found us, thanks so much for joining us. We're empowering uh, colleagues to. Uh, make better financial decisions doing exactly like this. We also have some medical students in, which is great. Uh, I love that. Um, Kerry's an SD3 in dermatology. Uh, yeah, so Kerry's saying how to get started when you don't have a big lump sum of cash behind you already. So that is exactly where I was about 10 years ago. If you uh, if you read the ebook, you'll know my situation. So this is perfect for you, Kerry, because we're going to show you how to get started with investing with you know, small amounts of money, even 20, 25 pounds a month, it all counts. And as you'll see, the earlier you start, the better. Um, so this is great. Uh, I think Ed is now in the chat as well. Uh, hopefully he's just sat down from his on-call day. Uh, if you've been on call today, feel your pain. I've been wearing PPE all day and my nose is a bit red, but anyway. Um, all right, we've got loads of you in here tonight, as you can see. Thanks for being so interactive in the chat. Now, as we go through, if you have any questions, like, yes, someone's asking a question already. So Ed's gonna mark those up as questions. And after about 20 minutes, we're gonna ask as many of those questions as we can. Someone else is in Chichester, Monica. This is amazing, probably just down the road from me. Um, so we're gonna ask questions after about 20 minutes. So definitely drop questions in the chat and then we'll ask them to tonight's guest. But I think uh, now seems like a great time uh, to introduce tonight's guest. So. Mike, do you want to come on screen and? Hi, Mike. Hiya. Good evening, everyone. Yeah. Do you want to give yourself the intro and um, let's let's get started? I think. 
Not a problem. So uh, my name is Michael Harms. I'm a director and chartered financial planner of Medical in General. Uh, we're an independent financial advisory firm based in Devon, but with technology, we're able to give advice across the country, as we've been doing quite a lot with uh, with people like yourselves through Medics Money, which has been really, really good over the last few months. Um, I've been providing advice, financial advice now to medics for around 10 years. So have a, a huge amount of knowledge and experience in uh, the NHS pension for one, but also understanding the, uh, the, the the various different roles that you go through within your career, uh, the various different pain pinch points, uh, what's important to you. Uh, so we've got a real understanding of, of what's important, how we can try and make the most of your money, but also support you with things like mortgages with specialist lenders, um, uh, protecting your wealth through, you know, life cover and income protection is quite poignant at the moment, obviously, with what's going on with COVID and all the way through to wealth management, starting small, working our way through to, to larger sums of money. And, and really, it's a cradle to grave service. So um, we have expertise in all of those areas. And as I said, I've, I've uh, been giving advice to medics for, for about 10 years, specialising with GPs for about eight of those years. So awesome. that's a good background. Yeah, and just before we went on on air, we were just talking about income protection because uh, that's a hot topic at the moment. Maybe if we get time at the end, we'll go through the conversation that we just had, Mike, about that because we're getting tons of questions about people. Uh, can I get income protection if I've been near COVID or whatever? But that is a different subject. But if we, if you want to hear about that, drop a question in the comments. One thing to say is you said, Mike, that you're a chartered financial planner. Now, uh, financial advisors' postnomials are almost as confusing as doctors' postnomials. There seems to be loads of them. So do you want to just tell us what a chartered financial planner is? Absolutely. So um, in essence, there are various different levels of, of financial advisors and you need to be careful when you're looking at qualifications as to how uh, knowledgeable the advisor is that you've got in front of you. So um, a bit like you guys, we, we have to go through a series of exams. Um, ultimately, I've sat around about 20 exams and there are no further exams for me to take. It basically means I've got as much knowledge as I possibly can about all things financial, um, which hopefully gives you confidence that you're dealing with uh, an advisor who, you know, uh, has the, the right morals, the right ethics, and also knows what they're talking about. So if you're to like use a medical analogy, you're basically, you've completed all your training. So you're like the equivalent of a consultant or a GP, basically. Is that a fair analogy? Uh, absolutely, yeah. We, we have uh, a couple of specialisms in various different areas. Um, one particular area, obviously, uh, final salary pensions is an area that I focused on. That's obviously very poignant based on all of the pension schemes that you guys are in. So um, it allows me to give advice in that particular area. And, um, you know, we, we still learn things about the NHS pension scheme every day, even after 10 years of, of being involved with it. But hopefully, if we don't know the answer to your questions, we certainly know how to find out for you. Cool. Um, there's some great questions coming in. Uh, Mary's asking, uh, looking for the best thing to do with my money now that saving rates have tanked. This is for you. Uh, shall we just get into it? Because there's so many questions coming in. After about 20 minutes, we'll have a break and fire some questions at Mike. Some of the questions uh, require a crystal ball. So I hope you've got your crystal ball warmed up, Mike. Uh, shall we get into the slides now? Absolutely. All right. I'll start the slide for you. Brilliant. Right. OK, everyone. Um, so uh, really, the, the aim of today is to introduce you to investing. Um, I think just looking at some of the chat messages, it's quite clear that uh, it, it's it's an area that can be confusing, um, an area that really just feels out of out of depth in, in some respects. And um, the aim of, of today's webinar is really to give you the greater understanding of uh, investments, how they work, the pros and cons. Um, and how investments over different time frames can actually achieve your goals. So it might be you want to save for a house deposit. It could be that you're looking at longer term savings for children's school fees, for university costs, um, or basically just be uh, saving longer term, possibly for retirement plans. So obviously, with the changes in the NHS pension scheme from 1995 to 2008 and now 2015 and, and increasing the, uh, the date at which you can retire means that actually a lot of medics are now looking for flexibility and other alternative investment options on how you can get there. So, um, as I said, the aim really is a walkthrough um, of that. Uh, the main principle of medical in general and, and the reason why I created medical in general was be able to support your profession and really give you an education and understanding. Once you've got that information, then you can make informed financial decisions. And that is ultimately what we're trying to achieve with everything we do. So we always start with education. Uh, make sure you understand where you are today, 
what the options are going forward and then you can make that really clear informed decision and know that it was the right decision for you at the time so um what we do is we're going to just go on uh, we've got to clear out a, a few disclaimers here as with all webinar presentations and um, the first thing to say is that we are regulated by something called the financial conduct authority you may or may not have heard of that ultimately it means that whenever you receive advice from a financial advisor you are treated as a retail customer and that basically means you get uh, the highest level of protection so in the event of, of being mistreated or given poor advice then you have recourse so i think that's really important you can find our details under the register um, with our reference which is on this screen um, we also will be talking later about a new proposition which is medical and general investments direct and that's a trading style of medical and general independent financial advisors the usual caveats when we talk about investments is that this presentation does not constitute advice. It is purely here for um, a conversation to educate you and give you hopefully clear insight into investments. And uh, we will be touching on performance. We will be touching on graphs and information about how various different things have performed over time. Um, you can't rely on that. And uh, the classic caveat that, you know, value of investments and any income from them can go up and down and you may get back less than you invested. And the classic past performance is not a reliable guide to future performance. So I've cleared that up. Uh, we've done that. We can now move on. So what are investments? Uh, the million dollar question. Now, it's it's quite a complicated area. So what we do is we break it down into four asset classes. And when we talk about general investing, there are lots and lots of different types of investing, cryptocurrency, gold, all sorts of things. But when we look at mainstream investing, there are four main areas. And, and they're categorized as cash, bonds, property, and equities. Now, some of these you may have heard of, others you may not have. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna walk our way through each of these asset classes, just so you can get a really deep dive understanding of each of them. And then we're gonna build that picture up, talking about risk, capacity for loss, and then hopefully when we get to talk about portfolios and the way you can invest, all of a sudden, this will hopefully come together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, as I say, you know, we're going to have a conversation after about 20 minutes. If there's anything that's jumped out or you don't think has been explained properly, please put your hand up, put a question in, and hopefully I can give you a bit more clarity on that. So let's get going. So the first one is cash. Now, everyone hopefully knows what cash is. This is literally just the money you've got in your bank account. It's an asset class where the funds are accessible. You can receive interest on them. Uh, you know, it might be a current account. It could be a savings account. You might have premium bonds you inherited from your grandpa, your grandma and grandpa uh, or even other national savings products. So um, just a quick thing here. National savings is a government uh, savings scheme and they can be premium bonds or national savings certificates or just a, a savings account. But when we talk about cash, this is money that you can access immediately. Now, most people feel that cash is a safe haven. It's a place, you know, we, we often hear people say, I'm better off keeping it under the bed. Um, I know where it is. I, I can see it. I can feel it. it, it it's there. Um, and, and really what we want to do is just talk through the risks associated with each of these asset classes. So when we talk about cash, actually, your capital is secure. So that's the first thing to say. So you put £100 into a savings account. You know that you will get back £100. However, there's the silent killer to your savings. And that silent killer is inflation. So what I'm going to do now is just move on to this next slide. And what this shows you is the impact inflation has on your money. Now, many of you might know what inflation is, but for those of you who don't, it's a general increase year to year in the prices of goods and technically, therefore, a fall in the purchasing value of your money. So what they usually do is they look at it as a, a change in the, the price of a basket of goods. They literally take a shopping basket and, and kind of look at what is generically uh, the sorts of products that people are buying every year. And they have two ways of measuring inflation. One is CPI, known as the consumer price index. And the other one is RPI, which is the retail price index. Now, for many, many years, the UK government used RPI and that used to link all uh, was linked to all types of um, final salary schemes. And then uh, more recently, when Gordon Brown was chancellor, he changed a lot of this back to CPI. The fundamental difference is that CPI is usually a lower figure, as shown in this graph, and uh, it doesn't include the cost of mortgages. So it, that just shows you that the variety of things that are included within a basket of goods uh, in inverted commas. So what we're showing here is uh, the purple line uh, C 
is a money fax 90 day notice account. It, it's just a, a sort of a, a proxy of all sort of savings accounts and the type of rate of return you might have got over the last five years. And you can clearly see that that got us up to just under 4% as return. But what we can also see is that CPI uh, has come in at around about 8% and RPI even higher at over 12%. So hopefully what that shows you is that the cost of goods and services have increased far above the return you're getting on your cash. So whilst you physically still have your £100 you've invested, you can't buy the same thing with that money. It's going to cost you more. So technically, the value of your cash has eroded over time. Now, it's important to say that cash is a necessity within your working life. And it's essential that really before you start investing, you make sure you have sufficient emergency funds available. Um, on average, we say three to six months uh, of earnings. That, that would be a, a net earnings. That would be a really good starting position. So it just means that, you know, the car breaks down, the washing machine broke. Uh, you know, you need to replace these things. You've got the funds available. Or even if, for example, um, there's a period of time where you can't work for whatever it might be, then you've got something you can fall back on. So that's really important as a, as a startup. Before we go any further, you need to make sure you have a good emergency fund under your belt. So what we're going to do now is move on to the next asset class, which are called bonds. Now, you might have noticed just a moment ago when we were talking about cash, we, we talked about cash bonds and they are savings bonds. But here, what we are talking about are gilts, so government debt and corporate debt. Now, if we go back to 2008 when we had the credit crisis and actually more recently with the COVID pandemic and where we are right now, the government is finding and creating lots of money to support the economy. Now, how they do that is they issue debt. And what I mean by that is they actually go out to um, investors uh, within the UK uh, or abroad and they basically say, look, what we're going to do is we're going to we need to raise a billion pounds. Um, and they do that in 100 pound chunks. So every gilt has a what we call a par value of 100 pounds. Now, what that basically means is they suggest uh, they say that they will basically pay back your money to you of 100 pounds. That's guaranteed. And they will do that after a five year time frame a 15, 10, five to 15 year time frame or a 15 years plus could be an open ended time frame. But you are guaranteed to get your capital returned. And the reason we know it's guaranteed is because the UK government have a double A credit rating. Now, that's it used to be triple. It, it reduced because of what went on with um, with the 2008 credit crisis. But ultimately, it is pretty much as good as having the money in your pocket. But what they do then is they actually provide you with uh, an interest rate and, and that's called a coupon in the industry. And it's basically a return on your investment. You lend them £100 and in return, they might, for example, give you a return of 2% per year. Now, that is the government lending money and that is known as a gilt. We then have the same principle applied for companies. And that could be an example uh, might be a, a uh, Tesco's. So if I move on to the next slide, um, what we can see here is is corporate bonds and um, Tesco want to build new stores. Um, th there's two ways they can do this. They can issue shares or they can issue debt. Now, um, the route they take will depend on the financial position at the time and issuing debt is actually easier for them uh, and they can raise funds much, much quicker. Now, whilst some companies have high credit ratings, they can fail as we've seen recently with a lot of large entities. But what they will do is they will again come out to the public, to pension funds, to, to all types of companies that want to invest and people that want to invest and basically offer the same deal as the government, but the risks are higher because they could go bust. So there's not as much of a guarantee that you would get your money back. As a result, the coupon, the interest rate that they provide you, will normally be higher than you would receive within the UK government. Now, I forgot to mention on the previous slide, uh, there could be countries abroad um, that, that also issue debt, but actually it would cost you, uh, well, the chances of you getting your money back, for example, from, from Greece a number of years ago would have been far less likely than the UK when you put those two up against each other. So as a result, the risk would be perceived as higher and therefore um, the return you should receive on those gilts and corporate bonds should also be higher. So if you note, know, we start talking about risk and reward, uh, but gilts and corporate bonds are normally seen as sort of lower end of the risk scale. 
That being said, you might have noticed here on the slide, I've mentioned that there are any credit uh, corporate bonds that have a credit rating below a triple B rating is seen as a junk bond. So these are seen as higher risk bonds. And, you know, you've really got to know what you're doing if you're going to invest in these, which is why you tend to employ fund managers and other things like that. But it is worth noting that when we invest as regulated financial advisors and for retail clients like you, it is unusual to invest in junk bonds and normally we invest in what are called investment grade bonds and these invariably are are listed as triple a all the way down to triple b okay so hopefully that just gives you a bit of an overview on gilts and bonds and cash so the next thing we're going to move on to then oh before we do that actually uh just interestingly talk about how gilts and corporate bonds performed in the market crash earlier this year so um what we've got here are, are three lines now, the first line, which is the purple line, I'm going to say down here, um, that is uh, basically UK sterling corporate bonds. That's all maturities across all time frames. So that could be some that are maturing shortly. And what that means is you get back your hundred pounds and then there'll be others that will be maturing in 15 years time. But it's a it's a, um, a composite of all of those. Now, what you can see here is that the value of those bonds goes up and down, and that's because they're bought and sold on the market. Now, they're bought and sold on the market because everyone wants bonds normally when markets get quite volatile. And so as we've seen in March, we saw a real drop in the market. And as a result, um, there, there tends to be a, a far better performance in these kind of asset classes and why it's important to have some of your money invested in these, depending on how much risk you're prepared to take. So if we look at that, we can see that the corporate all maturities actually, when we got to March, dropped so why did they drop? It's because they were um, issued by companies. And ultimately, when we saw the markets drop, we saw COVID hit. There was a complete um, open ended goal as to, to when this might end or how companies might fare as a result of it. So as a result, the markets react quite significantly to this. And at that point in time, we saw a drop within corporate bonds. However, it's interesting to see that the, the sort of the green line which is sterling gilt. So remember that's government debt actually bounced temporarily, dropped a little bit, but not dramatically, and then came back to a really positive territory. So one thing to remember is when we're talking about investments and asset classes, gilt's government debt is still seen as a really strong safe haven when things are bad. This is the port in the storm, so to speak. And then we have the red line in the middle, and this is corporate bonds, so company debt, but they have a very, very short duration is what we call it, which is one to five years. So they're going to mature very shortly. So what that means is their price, their par value will be £100. So just to highlight that a little bit more, you buy on day one a, a gilt for £100 um, and you get a 2.5% interest rate on that. Tomorrow, someone comes along and says, I really would like that gilt and I will pay you £102 for that and you say okay great thank you very much i've got 102 pounds you're giving up your two and a half percent interest but now their return is lower because they're getting two and a half percent return but it's not on 100 pounds they've actually paid 102 pounds for it so their yield has reduced so what we find is that the longer the guilt or the longer the corporate bond has to run the higher the value will increase in terms of capital value and the yield will decrease. And then as it gets shorter in duration, as it gets closer to being paid back out, that capital value comes back to 100 par value. So that's how bonds work. They, they go up and down based on demand and also the time horizon that they've got left to invest. So hopefully that just gives you a bit of an oversight. So even when the markets dropped, they did recover very, very quickly. And it showed you that actually this is where everyone wanted to be when times got rough so we're going to move on now and we're going to look at property now this is something that everyone's hopefully familiar with you're either renting you either own or you're you're trying to save to own um, but when we talk about property we we really it can mean a lot of different things so um you know whether you're a gp partner owning a surgery it, it all covers property investing and as i said a lot of you have already personal experience of that it is tangible you have bricks and mortar you can see it and feel it but also when we look at property investing, we also are referring to commercial properties. So we're talking about high street shops. We're talking about big cinema complexes, uh, offices, commercial premises, all of those things. 
And obviously they've taken a, a fairly big hit over the last six, 12 months based on what's gone on with COVID. Now, property is seen actually as a fairly high risk asset class. And, and the reason is, is because it's illiquid. You can't get your hands on the money straight away. Now, if we look at cash, that's readily available. Gilts and bonds, you can buy and sell them daily. So again, they can be accessed relatively quickly. And then we move on to property. Now, property, uh, again, um, I was just talking to Tommy prior to this about um, how long selling and buying a property can take. And, and that just shows you that actually in the current climate, it could take you three or four months to actually get your property through. Um, and as a result, you can't get your hands on that cash. It's illiquid. And as a result of that, the risk is perceived to be higher. So if we just move on, I'm going to show you a little graph here. And this is actually uh, what's called an iShares UK property fund. And it's a tracker. It tracks UK property. And that's mainly covering retail and office space. So you can see actually over the last five years, it hasn't been a great place to be invested. But it did have a bit of recovery around the beginning of 2018. And actually just prior to, to COVID, things were looking pretty positive in that market. But since then, obviously, the high streets closed. We're seeing lockdowns in pubs amongst other places. So um, things look quite bleak in this area. And also, I think it's important to say that a lot of the, the office buildings now, um, employers are starting to realise that employees can work from home. And do they need all of the office space that they once had? So when we're talking about property, um, invariably, we wouldn't invest directly in property. We might want exposure to it for diversification purposes, and we'll come on to diversi diversification a little bit later. But ultimately, um, we would track a market. So something along these lines where you are not directly holding the asset, but you are tracking the market. So you get some exposure, but you can get in and out far, far easier. And then we'll come on to the final asset class, equities. You may have heard of these as stocks and shares. So you own shares in a business, and that effectively means you are entitled to vote. You can help vote, uh, you know, the board of directors in. You can try and make change. Um, Legal and General just came out today as a big pension fund manager and said that they're going to uh, start to affect change by invoking their rights to vote. Um, and that's mainly around environmental, sociological and, and governance. So there's a real shift change in, in how investments and actually governance of companies is going to be going forward. So that's a real, real positive, but it shows you how you can have an impact. Um, but it basically means that the big key here is that you own a share of the profits and you own a share of the market value of that company. Now, the value of companies fall and rise, and that depends on how valuable they are perceived to be within the market. If there is a demand for them, that the value goes up and the cost of those shares go up. And if the value, if the demand is lower and the perceived returns or the perceived um, growth forecast for that company is low, then the value of that company will go down as well. So equities are seen as the highest risk asset class, especially if you just hold shares in one company, because literally you are on that roller coaster ride. So let's just go to the next page and this just gives you an idea. Um, just again, over the last five years, how two uh, equities have performed. Now, one is actually uh, a composite of all of the technology companies um, across the world. And then we've just plucked BP out because that's a, a fairly uh, standard equity that people would hold within their portfolio. Now, what you can see is BP was, was doing pretty well, uh, fairly steady returns over the course of time. And then the impact of COVID, no one's buying fuel, there was a, a real glut of oil within the world meant that all of a sudden their valuation was was wiped off and the last five years of growth disappeared overnight literally overnight now it recovered a bit and, and it's now really back to zero so when we look at that is five years of market growth have gone because of what's happened in terms of uh covid so it just shows you how some companies can do really well and this is what the case in point here is. If we look at technology companies, the fact that we are doing a webinar tonight, um, the fact that most of um, my meetings, for example, are now using Zoom. Um, Zoom, uh, my understanding was it was on its knees just prior to, to lockdown. It was going to fail. And actually, it has, it has turned into a multi-billion pound company now as a result of what's happened. So there are always winners and losers in any type of political or market event. Anything that you hear in the news will potentially have an impact. And it's always difficult to understand how that might 
actually extrapolate out to various different companies. So we can see here technology has gone through the roof. Um, again, I was talking to, to Tommy uh, when we did a podcast and we were talking about Apple and how it doubled in value within a six month period. Now, they're not selling new. They're not selling more phones. They're not selling more technology. It's just the fact that actually they, they were seen as a safe haven. Technology is the future. And in essence, it's brought forward a lot of change to our economy, the world economy, uh, and, and probably transformed the world as we know it going forward. So this just shows you how fortunes of companies, fortunes of industries can change on a flip of a coin. So I then wanted to come on to what we classify risk pyramid. And it's very, very straightforward. The greater level of risk, the potential greater reward. Now, I say that with a big caveat, because as we've just shown on equities, depending on when you take your money in and when you take it out can determine whether you get greater reward or not. But ultimately, you can see here that cash is at the bottom with the lowest risk, with the lowest reward. And we know that because inflation is normally outstripping the interest you're receiving. And then we move our way through the pyramid up to the top with equities at the top of the tree. So hopefully that's a fairly self-explanatory pyramid there for you to, to look at. Um, I then just wanted to put everything onto one graph just so you can see how they all interact and actually get some uh, context of all of the different asset classes. So um, we've got cash there in the lime green. We've got inflation in the red. Uh, we've got bonds as the sort of black brown line. We've got equities as the blue line. And then we've got property down the bottom. Now, ultimately, if you have a combination of all of these asset classes, all four asset classes, the aim is to get you somewhere in between all of those, smooth out some of those highs and lows and give you consistent returns over the course of time. But it's worth saying that when you're investing on a regular basis, you can take advantage of these lows. So, for example, when we saw the markets drop in March, if you were regularly investing, you would have been buying throughout the dip in the market. So you are buying things when they are cheaper and then you will see those actually rise quite significantly over the course of time. The other thing to note is that this is all cyclical. So what goes up will come down, but overall the trajectory is upwards. Awesome. I think it's an awesome graph that, Mike, just putting it all together. So we've been through the different uh, sort of um, things that you can invest in and we're going to get into risk a bit more and stuff uh, in a minute. But I wondered if now is a good time to there's so many questions. Should we get into some questions quickly? Please do. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go from the bottom up. Uh, Sarah, who I recognize actually as a former Birmingham Med School alumni with me from 2008, <laughs> showing, showing our age there, Sarah. Hopefully you're looking a bit less wrinkly than I am. Uh, we're going to be talking about risk literally right now. So hopefully that'll cover your question. Uh, Gulia, your question is more about taxation, which is an interesting thing because the interplay between financial advisors and accountants, uh, you guys work together very, very closely. Gulia's yeah. is a bit more about uh, taxation, so we'll park that one for now. Uh, Vishal has a stocks and shares ISA with Plum, uh, and he wonders how he can switch out of it. And Rick has got a stocks and shares ISA with a 1.5% management fee. So I don't know if that's all in. Can he do anything cheaper with one and a half percent is pretty cheap can he do anything cheaper mike yes uh yeah stay tuned basically <laughs> Rick. that is the point of today um i've dropped a link in a sticky uh which is basically where we're heading with all of this i wouldn't recommend you check it out now but it is a piece of software which allows you to assess your risk build your own portfolio and start investing right now and the fee is what mike uh capped at one percent yeah so if you invest 50 pounds, it's just 1%. Is 1% for everyone. Absolutely, yeah, that, that's, the, yeah. that's the maximum. So, I mean, I'll, I'll come on to explain a bit more about that. <clears> cool, um, so we're getting are there. Quite important. Yeah. So Vishal, Rick, stay tuned because uh, we are heading there because charges are super important. Um, let me, Jenny's asking, is property a good investment now? We're gonna talk about that basically, diversification. Simran, yours is a great question about should you pay off your student loan early or not? Uh, if you read the ebook, you know I was 85 grand down when I started thanks to the student loan company and I'm clear now, which is just a great feeling. Um, we are gonna do a podcast on that uh, really soon. So stay tuned on that. I'm gonna have to park that one as well. Victoria has got a really good question. Um, she's asking, if you've got a lump sum, 
would you invest it or would you pay off the mortgage? Now, I know you can't give out specific financial advice, Mike, uh, Ben, you don't know the full details of Victoria, but do you want to just talk briefly about what kind of things you would be talking to Victoria about if she came to you for advice on that specific question? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's important to say that the first port of call when we're looking at giving financial advice, especially around lump sums, is do you have any debt? And I think you've always got to assess the cost of that debt um, versus the opportunity, the other alternative opportunity cost, um, i.e. what else can you do with that money? Now, if your interest rate on your mortgage is very, very high, then you would look at it and say, well, actually, I'm paying three and a half, four percent on, on an interest rate. Um, if I paid that off, then I'm technically going to be saving that in interest. And you could argue you're shortening the amount of time you've got to pay on that mortgage, the amount of time you're paying that interest. And actually, that's possibly a better way of dealing with that lump sum. Um, alternatively, you may have and, 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 and I think it's probably important to say it comes down to your objective. So there is no wrong it or wrong answer to this, but normally you would always suggest set a paying off the debt. Um, the objective might be, well, actually, I want to save and have liquid cash. And as I said at the beginning, it could be for school fees. It could be for early retirement. And, and that's when you might have that conversation about, well, what's the what's the opportunity cost? Well, if we invested over here doing something else with part of the money, will that allow you to retire early? And if you then started to overpay or you put a lump sum chunk into the mortgage, would you be able to finish that mortgage at the same time that perhaps you wanted to retire early? So it's about possibly running those strategies in tandem rather than one or the other. Um, it's a bit of a it's, it's not a black and white answer, I'm afraid. It really does come down to your circumstances, your longer term objectives and uh, how you feel about investing and your comfort around that. Um, uh, again, something that definitely is not a simple question or a simple answer. Sorry, Mike, we're making you work hard here tonight. But a lot of people are saying so. Prithvi is saying, do you recommend staying in the NHS pension or opt out and invest the same amount in other financially profitable investments? Um, OK, this is an easy one. Stay in the NHS pension. Yeah, um, it, it, it's it's an absolute no brainer. Um, there is no way that. I can sit here and say to you that you can do better with a private personal pension than what you would receive on the NHS pension itself. Now, again, this is a topic in itself and I could go through the facts, figures and numbers, not for today. However, um, you can save in other vehicles and that is how you can try and bridge a gap between possibly the date you want to retire. Might be mid 50s, might be early 50s, might be 60. And then, you know, between then and actually receiving your final pension around 65, 67, depending on what scheme you're on. So um, again, it will depend on your circumstances, but I would never ever advocate leaving the NHS pension scheme. Yeah, and definitely don't leave it without getting advice because um, Absolutely yeah, not. if you could trade your private pension scheme for our NHS pension scheme, Mike, <laughs> would you? Every day of the week. Every yeah. Day. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's had some negative publicity, the NHS pension. And if you're a GP like me and you have to chase capita constantly for your contributions and your total award statement's totally wrong, incredibly frustrating, but very, very rarely is opting out completely the right move. Which leads me on to Matthew's question as well. Um, he, um, Matthew is tempted to leave the NHS pension scheme for a tactical period of four years. This would give me a lot more in savings and reduce tax paid on going too far over the lifetime allowance. I'm aware it will reduce my annual pension value. The question is if I died or became, I mean, this might be a question for another day, Mike, but the question is if I died or became unwell in those four years, assuming he was out of the pension, how would this affect payouts to his nominated person? Okay, so I'm gonna rattle through this because it's quite a few points. Um, <laughs> Sorry. First thing, no, 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 don't worry, don't worry. So um, lifetime allowance, don't be afraid of it. All it means is you've capped out the most that you are allowed to get tax relief on. Anything you go above it, you will only see a tax charge of 25%, which will be taken from your income. And actually, the benefits of exceeding the lifetime allowance far outweigh the tax costs. Absolutely, every time I've done a calculation, there is no reason to be frightened of the lifetime allowance. Assuming you know about issue. it and don't get a shock, uh, you know, because a lot of people yeah, don't absolutely. take advice. If you don't take advice and you get a surprise, 400 grand tax bill, not ideal. 
But well, it's 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 more about the annual allowance that's the issue yeah. and where we found this happening with a lot of tapering for consultants who, who maybe were doing private work and were going over how much you can actually physically put in. Again, this is a whole webinar for another day. But in essence, the lifetime allowance in itself is not a reason to come out of the scheme. Um, every time I've ever considered it, you are better staying in and taking that small tax charge that gets hit at the top. It doesn't, it's not as bad as you first think. Don't be frightened by that. In terms of the benefits, if you come out of the NHS pension scheme, you give up some fairly good benefits. The first thing is that whilst you're within the NHS pension scheme, you receive sick pay benefits. So um, you get something potentially called an ill health retirement pension. And there are two, two tiers, tier one and a tier two. There is also death in service benefit which is normally around twice pensionable earnings. And then the final thing there is also you get dependents pensions. And depending on which scheme you're in, it can vary from a third to up to half of what you've accrued in your pension. So that's why it's important to make sure you get a total reward statement every year. If you're a GP or you're a medic that can't get a total reward statement, it's, it's saying they can't find it, then you need to call NHS Fleetwood and you need to say to them, I cannot access my TRS and they will have to do one manually for you. It is essential that you get that information. It is also essential that every year you request your what are called annual allowance pension input figures. Now, again, I think there will be more podcasts, there will be more um, uh, sort of webinars and information on, on the site, but it, it's really important you get that information. Now, if you become a deferred member, you don't get the same perks. So the ill health retirement pension isn't as good. You have to qualify for what is called a tier two, which means you cannot work in any capacity to get a tier one. Um, the death in service benefits aren't necessarily as strong, um, mainly around that death in service payment. So it, it's you get lots of whistles and bells that come with it that I sincerely hope you never have to claim on. Um, but again, Tommy sent out an email today to all of us who are who are with on the website um uh, about unfortunately some of your colleagues who have passed away and how we're going to try and help their uh, remaining spouses and families um in supporting them to get ill health uh, to get these death in service benefits so um it's better being in than out yeah that's a massive subject and you did really well to keep it uh, that brief um someone's asking about vanguard we'll definitely talk about that that's going to be relevant for what's coming up um there's so many questions here. I'm gonna, shall we carry on for a bit more and then I'll try and fire some more questions at you, Mike, if that's all right. Sure. And no um, hopefully for those, um, the last one maybe we should do, Lyndon is asking, where do you recommend keeping an emergency fund so it doesn't just suffer inflation related erosion, but is available if you need it? Um, go for it, yeah. Mike. Okay, that's a, that's a bit of a, a really difficult one when everyone's giving low interest rates, but notoriously, um, the Santander 123 account has actually been quite a good home. Um, they, they try to offer uh, better returns. It was about 1.85% for quite some time. I think that's just dropped. But they also do cash back on, on credit cards. Now, um, the, what I would suggest you do is go online, even Martin's money tips, you know, uh, look at look at the sort of cash savings accounts online um, and just see what you can find. Marcus Bank was quite a good one. That's part of Goldman Sachs. Um, but ultimately, there's also some regular savings where you can get three or four percent on a regular saving as long as it's 250 pounds a month going in something along those lines. So um, best bet is is go online, compare and contrast and just see what's what's the best rate at the time. Yeah. And I guess the point of the emergency fund is not to make money. That is not your investment fund. That is an emergency fund if you need it. Yeah. So as a, you just need to focus on keeping it instantly accessible. And if that means you have to you know take a slightly suboptimal rate on that cash you know you just have to suck it up um the emergency fund is really important and uh you know you need it accessible and it's it's hard to have it accessible but earning good money as well so um it's a really good question <laughs> yeah uh and that's why we're here because if you leave it all in cash uh, yeah not ideal okay great um there's loads more questions in here but let's let's carry on because i really want to get into the product which you just talked about or hinted about which is a super nice way for you to set up your own portfolio and get started so um i'll duck out and uh, carry on mike this is really great not a problem okay right so we're going to move into the next phase which is talking about risk and capacity for loss so we've talked about the asset classes we've talked about how risky those asset classes are but now we need to actually understand how you feel about risk. 
So there are three areas when we talk about risk. It's your overall appetite in general terms with regards to risk. That's investment risk. So are you prepared to see uh, the, the fund value go up and down? Um, so, so that's about your, your attitude. And um, we then look at your tolerance for loss and also your capacity for loss. So you might be perceived as having, having a high capacity if you're, you're earning really well, um, you're not spending all your money and you've got quite a lot of disposable income. It would be argued that you possibly have a high capacity for loss, but naturally you might feel very nervous about investing. And that is actually very, very normal for, for you as you start entering into investing. But as time goes on and you get used to it and you have regular reviews, possibly with a financial advisor, then you, you go over this stuff time and time again. And that's really important because you start to become familiar with it and more comfortable with the outcome. So there's lots of different things here. Um, risk, tolerance for loss and capacity for loss. So we talked about risk, we talked about capacity, tolerance for loss. How do you feel? Is it going to make you wake up in the middle of the night and be concerned that the value of your investments have dropped? Are you going to be looking on the app every single day? Now, that might be something you quite enjoy, which is absolutely fine. But then there are other people at the other end of the spectrum, which basically means you may have taken too much risk. So it's really important that you feel comfortable with firstly the amount you're investing, but secondly with the amount of risk you're taking. So when we talk about capacity for loss as well here is, is, is would that any potential loss in the market have any material impact on your day-to-day -day living? So we've got to be careful. You know, you only lose money if you take that out at the wrong point in time. We know that markets go up and down, but if you take your money out of the top, great. Right? But if you take it out of the bottom because you can't take the pain anymore or you think it's going to go down further, then that would suggest to me that you're probably in too high a risk portfolio. So hopefully that covers risk. It's, it, it's a massive area, but again, we haven't got huge amounts of time, so I'm going to move on. Um, and this is an area that actually a couple of you have, have asked questions about Vanguard and other things, and it's it's the, the conversation around passive investing versus active investing. So what I wanted to do was strip it back to its really, really basics um, and look at it in its sort of um, in its rawest form. So passive is seen as low cost and historically active investing has been seen as high cost. Now, a passive investment is effectively a way of tracking a market or an index with no human intervention. So, for example, we might be tracking the United States equity market. And it could be the S&P. So in this scenario, actually, what I've put here is the FTSE All Share. So we might have all heard of the FTSE 100. They're the top 100 UK companies. But if you want to get a clearer picture of how the UK economy is done as a whole and all the UK companies that are listed, we follow what's called the FTSE All Share. And that would give you exposure to the UK equity market. Um, we can then look at what's called the MSCI World Index. And that is a, a, a composite index of every company across the globe that is uh, effectively available to invest in. And again, that, all you are doing there is tracking that market. So if we look at the top 100 companies, if again, we'll come back to BP, BP there, and they make up 20% of the FTSE 100, then you will hold 20% in BP. You will hold 10% in Tesco's. You will hold 5% in Microsoft. Whatever it is, you will hold the composite based on the percentage that they make up of that index. You have no say over that. That is what is tracking it. You are not trying to beat the market. You are trying to replicate the market. But due to costs, you will never fully achieve the same return as what the market averages. It will be slightly lower. But that isn't the aim. The aim is purely, I want exposure. I don't want to pay high fees. I'm going to track the market. And you believe that the market is efficient. So what I mean by that, all information about all companies are out in the ether. There are no surprises. There are no gains to be made no calls to be made. You are literally going to track the market. OK, so that's passive investing. If we move on to active investing, this is the sort of opposite to passive. This is where there is human intervention. You will have a fund manager. You may have heard of that term. Uh, and in essence, they have a team of researchers who are sitting there looking at companies, looking at the financials of those companies, understanding the market they're invested in, um, trying to see if there are opportunities where other people think that there isn't they might perceive there to be an opportunity. So that human intervention should potentially give you better returns. But the classic argument then is, 
does that warrant the additional costs associated with active management of a fund? Now, I've written down the bottom here, this debate will rage on. Now, the reason it will rage on is because it all comes down to the data that you look at. And as we all know, data is manipulated. And depending on which side of the fence you sit on, you can prove either way, active is better investing, including charges versus passive. And the other way, passive investing is better than active. Um, ultimately, it comes down to how you feel about costs and charges, what your objectives are, and what we perceive to be the right route. Again, if you go down the route of having independent advice, you will get different views from different advisors. And um, in essence, the way we operate is that we take a, a bit of a combination approach. So we have what's called a hybrid solution, where we have some passive investments to keep costs low, but we also have some, some active investments to see if we can seek out those extra opportunities and create what's called Harifa and try and beat the market. Um, so hopefully that gives you a very brief overview. That's really talking about it in its very, very raw form. So we're going to move on now and actually discuss what a portfolio is. So this is a portfolio. Um, actually, I'm just going to move on to the next page, whether I've created now. Have, right. It's a couple of a couple further on. I'll explain it a little bit more. So um, a portfolio is basically where we have um, a, a collection of these various different asset classes. And depending on how much risk you're prepared to take, will depend on how that portfolio is constructed. So an example might be you're a medium risk investor. So when we look at risk scores, we will go from one through to 10, one being low risk, 10 being high risk. If you're say a five or six as a level, that's a medium risk investor. And actually significant proportion of the population come out as a medium risk investor. Now, what that would mean is you might have up to 60% of that portfolio invested in equities. And then the remaining 40% will be a combination of bonds, corporate and government debt, as well as property and possibly cash. And that will form your portfolio. Now, you will then invest in lots of different asset classes. So, sorry, lots of different, uh, lots of different industries, lots of different countries. And the reason why you're investing across lots of different industries and lots of different countries is to diversify. And the principle behind that is, one investment goes down, as we saw with BP, technology goes up, you're in a net gain position, and it's about trying to make sure that there is a low correlation between the asset classes to try and give you the best opportunity for longer term sustained returns. So I'm just going to go on to the next slide here, which just shows, again, a medium risk correlation map. Now, there's lots and lots of colour here, lots of numbers, but in essence, this is a medium risk portfolio that we might offer to one of our clients and what you can see here is that over the last five years there have been some positive correlation between different funds now these different funds that we've got here will invest in different asset classes they are doing different things but combined they they create our portfolio of equities bonds cash and property but we are going to the experts in their fields to basically say you know a lot about bonds Please, can you invest this money for us into bonds? And can you spread that across United States, Europe, UK? Actually, you know a lot about uh, equities in India. Please, can you invest on our behalf in equities to give us the, the Middle East and Far East exposure? But what the key here is that there is a significant proportion of low correlated assets. And that's important because actually over the significant long time, long term, you can see that the low correlation means that your assets aren't interacting. So if the markets go down, they don't all go down. That's really the principle behind low correlation. Negative correlation is that they do polar opposites. They're like two magnets, you know, pushing apart from each other. And then the positive correlation is unfortunately what we do see at moments of crisis. All of the assets sometimes come together and we see a, a short period of time where there might be a positive correlation. But ultimately when we're looking at portfolios and where you invest your money, we want to make sure there is as low a correlation between those asset classes and investment strategies as possible to give you the best opportunity of sustained return over the long term. So, again, a number of you talked about platforms. So I wanted to just really come on to um, how investments are mainly dealt with these days. Technology plays a big part and the way we can access the markets very, very easily and we can access portfolios very easily is through a platform. You probably would have heard of one. One was mentioned earlier, Plum. 
Uh, there's nutmeg, there's Highbridge lands down there. There's numerous copious amounts. And actually, as again, one of the people on the chat said, keep getting emails daily about should I invest on this platform? So um, a platform is a facilitator allowing you access to the markets. We then have here what's called a discretionary fund manager. That is someone who is, is a portfolio manager in essence. They are suggesting where you should be putting your money based on bonds, equities, cash and property, but also what countries you should be putting them in, what industries you should be putting them in, and ultimately which funds you should use to achieve the right outcome. So they, they have something called a tactical asset allocation. And um, that is their take on the world economy. So what you're asking them to do is to basically give you their sort of active overview of what's going on in the market and then suggest where you should invest your money. And then what I've done here is just given you three wrappers, as we call them in the industry. So three places, products you could put your money in. One is an ISA. Hopefully you're all aware of those individual savings accounts. And you can have cash ISAs and stocks and shares ISAs, as they're known. And actually, what's quite interesting now is that they're interchangeable. So if you had a cash ISA, you could move it into an investment ISA. And that can be done through the provider. Uh, equally, once you've finished investing, if you think I now want to move that into cash, you can move it back to a cash ISA. So they're fully flexible. We then have pensions. These are private pensions. And this is where once you put the money in, you cannot access that until you are age 55 in current legislation, but that will be going up to 57 in a couple of years. And then we have the final one, which is called a general investment account. Um, and that is effectively an ISA, but without the tax wrapper that you get with it. So ISAs are completely tax free. We never used to be able to say that, but they now are tax free. A general investment account is an ISA without the tax free wrapper attached. And what you would tend to find is that um, if you've maximized your ISA for the year, which is £20,000, you would then overspill into a general investment account. And then as of the next tax year, you could move that money from the general investment account into the ISA. Um, there are taxes associated with that, such as capital gains tax. But what you can then see is under each of those wrappers, you might then invest in a selection of passive and active funds. And it's the discretionary fund manager that has suggested which passive and active funds you might have moved into. So I don't know if that's a good time to just pause again. Um, Definitely. I mean, yeah. Um, you're getting a lot of love for your answers to your previous questions uh, in the chat. <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, no pressure. Uh, but I'm about to fire <laughs> more completely random questions at you. Uh, so um, I might start from the top this time. Uh, Goya uh, asked a question about tax earlier, which uh, we just can't answer today because it's too heavy. But she's asking a great question now. Um, why should I go for an active investment to pay a hedge fund manager if SPGI is outperforming them? So uh, I think you just mentioned active versus passive to present uh, both sides of the debate. But uh, if you click the link just up there in the chat, you'll see which side of the debate uh, that uh, Mike's coming down on. But yeah, it's a good question. Okay. So why would so, you go for active? OK, so firstly, hedge fund managers are not um, they, they sound very glamorous, but they're, they're playing in a very different world. You know, they're, they're not what we're talking about here. We are talking about mainstream investing. Um, hedge funds are not mainstream investing. So that's the first thing to just clarify. Um, in terms of active versus passive, it really depends. Are you comparing apples with apples? And what I mean by that is, are you comparing a UK passive fund with a UK active fund or something along those lines? As I said, it's very easy to show one is outperforming another in a certain circumstance. And there will be times when an active manager will outperform a passive manager and vice versa. Um, ultimately, investing is about having time in the market and making sure that you're there for the long term and doing it in the right way. Um, and then trying to figure out. And then that's really where you employ the services of an IFA really is to try and understand, well, what is the best route? The one thing to say is cheap isn't always better. It really depends on what that active manager is trying to do. So what we've seen, for example, is there are some active fund managers out there who um, who will do extremely well in a down market because of the way they run their portfolio or their, their fund and what they invest in and how they invest. Um, a passive fund will definitely go down with the market they're tracking. So that is where you could be argued that a, a, an active manager might outperform a passive. 
Um, again, I'm sure if you looked, you will find examples where that's not true, but equally you will also find examples where it is true. Cool. Um, there's loads of pension questions. What I'm going to say about pension questions is we, I want to stick to investing tonight. If you go on our YouTube, we did an hour and 25 minutes on pensions webinar and we got in seriously deep. So someone's asking <laughs> if I'm going to be here five years and then leave the country, what should I do? We answer that question. Someone's like, all of those pension questions are answered in that hour and 24 minutes. Um, someone's just arrived from watching Bake Off to watch this. So welcome. Um, don't <laughs> put any no spoilers okay uh in the chat for bake off um okay um lots of people are asking about leases do you want to talk quickly about leases um, okay, and if, so you're over uh, 40, if you're over 40 and you haven't got one you might want to shut your ears now because yeah you're not going to like this yeah yeah so uh, before your 40th birthday you can take out a lisa or a lisa however you want to pronounce it um it's basically a lifetime isa and you can contribute up to £4,000 a year and it comes out of your ISA allowance, which is £20,000. Now, the advantage for this, it actually replaced the help to buy ISA. Um, and I think another one that they had many moons ago. Uh, but ultimately, what the aim is, is to every April, you put four, up to £4,000 in and the UK government will give you a 25% uplift. So that will become £5,000 every April. Uh, ultimately, it only maintains that if two things happen, one, you buy a property with it, and then you get to keep that extra growth of 25%, or alternatively, um, after a set period of time, you're a bit of putting more in, and then that will become effectively payable to you as a form of a pension, age 60. So this could help bridge a gap um, for those of you that might want to consider retiring a little bit early or having alternatives, as well as using your ISA. Cool. Um, Matthew's asking, Matthew, we're literally about to go on to this. Um, everyone wants to see the punchline. Shall we get to the punchline, <laughs> Mike? Because I, I'm really excited about this. Like I've been investing for 10 years and um, when I started, something like this just wasn't available. If it was, my life would have been a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> so let's get into it, shall we? Not a problem. OK, right. So I'm just going to go on. This was just a little bit of an overview of how an IFA can help. I think we've touched on that quite a lot anyway, so I won't harp, harp on about this. But um, ultimately, outside of an ISA and other things like that, if you need tax advice or you need support in longer term planning, you really do need to seek advice of an independent advisor because they will be able to give you the full overview of your circumstances. So let's move on. So uh, medical and general investments direct. So. Um, this actually came out of a conversation, again, with Tommy. We had quite a few conversations, as you'd imagine. And um, we were talking about the advice gap. So what's happened over the years, and the fact that we're having this webinar, and the fact that so many of you are here, is that you don't know where to start, or you don't know who to trust, or you don't know where to go. And the world is a very, very different place to what it was 15 years ago. And ultimately, what we realised is that financial advice can actually be perceived as quite expensive as you might perceive accountancy fees and solicitors fees. And a lot of that comes down to regulation costs and the costs associated with actually operating within the financial advice arena. Um, so what it means is, unfortunately, like all these things, products wise, the fees have to be passed on. But what it can actually do is stop yourselves from investing. It's a barrier to the market, a barrier to entry, a barrier to even just get started. And I can't say this enough. The earlier you start, the younger you start, the more you can put in over a longer period of time, the, the, the better place you will be in the long run. So ultimately, this came out of us having a conversation about how we can bridge that gap. Now, there are lots of what are called robo advice services out there, which is where you log onto a website and it takes you through this process similar in some respects to this. The difference here is that we are uh, majoritively we are we are an independent financial advisory firm. So if you come to us as an IFA, we have access to the whole of the market in terms of investments. That's all active, all passive. And we will research and, and assess what is appropriate for you. But in order to try and provide a service that can support you in the early years and just to be aware, this is a product or a process you can go through. But at any point in time, you could flip over to a, a full independent advice service with us or a another um, but this is about trying to bridge that gap so what have we actually done we've partnered with a large company called Parminium and they're based in Bristol and they're actually part of Standard Life they're a large so they've got a lot of pedigree and, and support behind them now you may or may not be able to see there's quite a few awards there that they've won over the years now um, that just shows you they've got pedigree but 
the reason we actually went with them is that um, we use them for some of our other investments, some of our ethical investing that we do. They're very good on that. Um, but again, their costs and charges can be, be higher for that type of service. But what they actually offered was a passive investment solution. And we felt quite comfortable partnering with them. But we will review this and continue to review this as a proposition as to whether they remain the right place. Uh, but ultimately, we partner with them. And what we've created is medical and general investments direct. Um, it is a restricted proposition. So what I mean by that is I've talked about independent. We have whole of market. This is restricted. We are only giving advice to you on this one product. And we're only giving advice to you on ISAs and a general investment account. So this doesn't unfortunately give you access to pensions. It doesn't give you access to VCTs. It doesn't give you access to any you know, other bits and pieces. That's where you need to kind of take that leap over into the full financial service. But this gives you an ability to dip your toe in um, and certainly experience things as you go along, knowing that you can pick the phone up to, to us and have a conversation if you get stuck or you need a bit more support. Um, and we can certainly guide you through this, not a problem. So what will it look like? So you, you come to this as a first page, and we're going to ask you if the advice is right for you. This is touching on all of the things that I've actually discussed with you tonight. You know, have you got the right cash reserves? It will ask you all of these questions and we'll start to try and build up a picture on you. The important thing is that actually you can go through all of these questions and get an overview of the investment strategy that would be recommended without actually having to put any personal information in. So you're not on the hook. You don't feel like you're, you know, you're giving away your information. It's a case of let me explore this. And then only if and when you feel comfortable, you can then proceed. So we move on to the next page here. So getting started, it will give you basically a walkthrough of what happens next. And then it will start to ask you what, what you would like to invest. So I just plug some figures in here just so you can see. Um, I, I can't actually see that. I think it's a bit too small, but I think it's about a thousand pounds and then three, 350 pounds a month. Um, and would I like to use my ISA allowance? So on and so forth. And you can see down here, it's suggesting how much we go into an ISA and then a smaller, well, zero at the moment into a general investment account. So move on. Uh, it will then start asking some basic information about you, age, gender, uh, do you have any financial dependence? All of this is helping us and Parminian build up a picture as to what's going to be appropriate for you. So I think it's important to realise that you are actually receiving advice from us, albeit restricted and albeit through a process, but you are receiving financial advice. And I think hopefully that gives you a bit more comfort knowing that there is actually a human at the end of the phone. You've seen us and you can pick the phone up and have a conversation. So um, we'll then move on to risk tolerance. So we, we touched on this earlier. You know, how do you feel about investing money? Which of the following words will most associate with investing money? Uh, and then out of these portfolios, how would you feel if your investment went up by this amount, but also potentially could drop by this amount? So which portfolio would you feel comfortable with? So there are about nine questions here. And it's just pushing the boundaries, understanding what you feel comfortable with and what you don't feel comfortable with. And then we move on. And ultimately, once you've completed all of those, we're going to give you a risk tolerance grade. And that risk tolerance grade will then be explained what we mean by that. It will give you a rough idea of the likely projection of returns over the course of time, depending on the time frame you've agreed at the start. And then it will give you some information about history. And history is important. It's certainly not a reliable guide to future performance. But if we believe in cycles and we believe the markets will act the same and we have boom and bust and, you know, the economy goes up, it goes down, then we will see how this reacts under different conditions. So we can see here the highs and the lows. This is giving sort of your maximum returns and your lowest end returns. And that hopefully makes you feel comfortable and, and gives you an expectation of what could happen. And that's really, really important for you to understand what could happen so there are no nasty surprises. Um, you get here to basically play with the time frame. So you can say you can see here it's changing years. I've got 10 years. You can move that to 15. You can move it to five. Uh, and then the, the risk grade, you might say, well, actually, let's see how that is. If I move that up to a seven, what would that give me in terms of return? What if I move it down to a three? Would that get me where I need to be? So you get to play with this. It's quite intuitive. We then move on to the next bit. And this is actually starting to talk about capacity, your risk capacity. So we talked about risk and how much your attitude to risk is. We're now moving on to talk about risk capacity. So what is your ability to actually invest this lump sum? So we want to make sure you have emergency funds. We want to make sure that you don't need to pay off some debt first. Uh, we want to make sure that you can survive and that there are no issues there. Um, and, you know, it will ask you some questions again about another, uh, I think it's about another five or six questions there. And then ultimately it will come out with your proposed risk grade. 
Now, in this scenario, what I actually did is I moved my risk grade to a seven off the back of the risk questions, the original ones. Um, but actually, off the back of the second set of questions, we as a financial advisory firm believe that actually a level six is appropriate for you based on your circumstances. Now, ultimately, that means that is the only grade that you can invest in. And the reason that is, is because we are giving you the advice. If you go to some of these other platforms, they are effectively operating on what's called execution only. So they are taking your authority and your knowledge to go ahead with a um, with an investment. As I said, there's no really support for you from that perspective. So hopefully this gives you comfort that, you know, we're, we're behind the scenes for you. So what we then go on to is you will then be provided with an investment proposal and that will actually detail the costs and charges. So we mentioned earlier here, you can just see here, there's an initial charge, there's an ongoing charge. Um, there are no initial charges. That's the first thing to point out. Um, so there are no costs, no barriers to entry. You can literally invest and 100 percent of that money will be invested. Uh, and then here, in terms of the ongoing charges, that is split down between Parminion as a platform taking a fee, Parminion, Parminion as a portfolio manager taking a fee for managing the money um and uh, and investing in various things and then also we take a very very small fee to be able to provide this service and all of that comes in less than one percent so you are investing in passive investings um ultimately you'll come to this page you can download your investment proposal what that will do is ask for an email address only you can save and continue later or you can actually get started and go and invest. And it will take you through then the personal questions and ask for some information such as your national insurance number and your direct debit details or how you want to make your, your payments. So hopefully that gives you a, a real very whistle stop tour of um, a product that hopefully will allow you to get started with the comfort and knowledge that there is an IFA at the, the end of the phone who understands you. Awesome um thanks so much for that mike that was really really useful um i mean i'm really excited about this product because as you said uh it just breaks down those barriers to getting started it does not replace the services of uh, an independent financial advisor a charter financial planner like yourself but if you just want to get started for a low cost on a nice product uh passive low cost um it's really nice and someone said earlier they were paying 1.5 percent with another platform um, I'd be interested to know if that 1.5% was all in because it might not be, but your platform, the whole lot is 1% all in. Is that right, Mike? Yeah, that, that's capped. It can actually be a lot less than that, depending on what you're invested in. If you're in a more cautious portfolio, then you're going to be investing in gilts and corporate bonds, which notoriously are cheaper because there's less <coughs> buying and selling. Um, and as a result, it might even be lower than that. So cool. So 1% max. Okay. Um, now someone's asked a great question about, um, can you still invest ethically uh, using this system? We have got a podcast on ethical investing coming out next week, I think. So I'd really recommend you tune into that because that is another whole thing. But yeah, we, we love ethical investing here for sure. Someone's apologizing for a typo, which is ironic because I'm not sure what's going on with these tonight, but they're just not working right on the keyboard. So sorry <laughs> about my typos. Someone's asking how we can contact you, Mike. I've put your link up, which shows your profile on Medics Money, and it shows reviews by GMC registered doctors that have actually used your surface. But is, a, is that a good way to contact you via Medics Money? or? Yeah, I think that's the best way. I mean, obviously, um, the whole principle is here that we, we're using Medics Money. So uh, the best, best route is go through there. Um, you can obviously then send a request for us to, to get in touch with you. Um, we'll automatically, you know, get that detail and, and drop you an email and try and get in contact when it's convenient. Um, obviously, you've got the link through to the the uh, the direct investing site. But it's probably worth noting that whilst we've talked about investments, I have mentioned we do cover all other aspects of it, including mortgages and protection. So depending on what you need help with, we're here to help. Yeah, and the link uh, for the software that Mike just demoed is at the top of the chat, and I've dropped it in again as well. Um, okay, um, shall we? We still got loads of people here. Um, the lure of Bake Off. Uh, you've, I think, you might have outdone Bake Off actually, Mike, which is uh, good. Um, <laughs> shall we just keep going on questions for a little bit? Um, yeah, feel free. I'm conscious that my kids keep waking up at like five a.m. at the moment, so uh every hour of sleep is precious and i'm sure there's others in this uh service irene is asking is there any time limit on joining your your service i think maybe she's talking about this advice proposition no um i think i think it's really important to just highlight that the aim of today isn't about 
um, putting any time frames on this. This is just trying to say, look, here's a service that hopefully you might get some use from. There are no time yeah. frames on it. Um, it's not yeah. a pressure sale. It's not a case of it's one one night only. Uh, this yeah, is yeah. this is there for the duration. Um, yeah. At the moment, we don't have this on our website. It is literally being trialed for you guys as a starter. Um, and then we'll probably uh, roll it out depending on how yeah. things go, just as an opportunity for all medics to, to hopefully have a go on. Yeah, what I would say is that those kind of high pressure sales tactics are the hallmark of, you know, someone that's trying to push you into something. And so anyone who sets a time limit on something like that, I know there's other financial professionals who may do that. That that's not, you know, that is not a good thing. So the, you yeah, just click no, that no. link. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, Tommy. Um, I was just going to say on that, if you do engage with a financial advisor, I think it's first it's important that you use someone who is uh, who knows your your profession. Um, secondly. Do they explain things to you? Because if they don't explain it, but they just say this is what you want to do, then then that's not really helping you. It's not giving you what you need. Um, so I think you've got to make sure since so the way we operate, as I said, is we, we educate, we support. If you need four or five meetings, if you're an IFA, you know, you're an independent client, then you need four or five meetings. That's what it takes to get you through that process, because you've got to make sure that you you fully understand it. You know, as medics, you didn't go in to medicine to become financial gurus. Yeah. And just think about it. If you're consenting yeah. a patient, you would never say to a patient, right, you've got five minutes to make your mind up and I'm not telling you any more information. As a doctor, you would never do that. OK. And a good financial advisor will never do that either. Um, Rick is asking, and this is a great question, um, how he's got. I'm assuming he's got a stocks and shares ISA elsewhere. Can he transfer into your Parminian one? And if so, how? Uh, I'm pretty sure he can. Uh, I cool. don't have the answer to that, but if it's okay, Rick, if I can get hold of your details, I can come back to you direct on that one and let you know how that yeah. can be achieved. Cool. Um, all right. So you've got here Mike's contact details. Mike, um, did you drop your email in here somewhere as well? Is that a good way? Yes, yeah, right at the beginning. Should I, should I go back okay. to the, the beginning? Show, uh, show that slide while I keep going through these questions. Lots of you. <laughs> Property investing, and we have a property investing webinar with a doctor who is also a property investor coming up real soon. So keep an eye on your emails. If you're not on our email list, the easiest way to join is probably by downloading our ebook, and I'll drop the link for that. But we have a property investment webinar. We're just trying to schedule it in with half term because everyone seems to have everyone's at the same stage of life, it seems. So we're trying to work it around half term because. We don't really want the kids on a webinar, um, but it's going to be likely the early part of November. Um, lots of you are asking about the replay. Replay comes out uh, 24 hours time. Someone's asking, where can I find your NHS pensions webinar? It's, if you have a look at Medics Money YouTube, I think we've only got about three videos on there. And one of them is a, a, a big pensions thing. But if you have any trouble finding it, let me know. But it, it's uh, it's up there. Uh, hey, Sarah, you're still here. That's cool. We went to medical school together and uh, you randomly come across this. Sarah is asking, oh, Mike, yeah, nice one. Let me get us out of the way so everyone can see. Yeah, sorry, your... we're, just, we're just right in the way. <laughs> uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, we're, we'll, we'll, move, we'll move over here. There so there you can see <laughs> Mike's contact details. Let's just leave it up. Um, yeah, Sarah is asking, is there any benefit of having your investments spread across all family members or lump them all together, i.e. separate investments to kids and then each adult or invest jointly? That comes down to different pots. So um, ultimately, depending on how much you're saving, if you're if you're not saving enough to exceed your ISA allowance, then you could just be putting into your your ISA. Um, depending on, again, the platform you're using and if you're a, an independent firm, for example, uh, using the independent firm, we're able to list and label the pots. So we can have one ISA one year that is for the kids university fund. We can have another pot that is growing for uh, the retirement fund uh, and we can we can do it that way. Um, alternatively, yes, you could look at it from an individual perspective and say, well, we might take out a junior ISA for the kids. The only thing there to be wary of is that the kids can access the money at 18 and they have access and control at 16. So, again, that's a whole conversation about whether you think that's appropriate or not. Um, and then basically, uh, so in answer, it, it really depends on your circumstances. But yes, different objectives should have different pots because you might take different risk. And we might say, well, actually, that's a 25 year time horizon. You can take more risk with that. And actually, a, um, a smaller pot that needs, is needed in five years, we might have to take a more cautious approach to it. Yeah, situation dependent. My kids have got junior ISAs. So I've got like 
14 years and 12 years to educate them on why they shouldn't have a massive 18th birthday party with the proceeds and perhaps continue to invest it. So well, the, the other alternative <laughs> is that uh, you, you try to hide any documentation that they never know that they've got one until an age that actually you feel it's... I'm going to wait till they grow up a bit. And I'll, <laughs> I mean, I might be up for a massive 18th party by that stage of life. Uh, you know, um, yeah, you're getting lots of compliments from David, Rosie. Um, this is a good question from Rachel. How does Parminion, which is what we talked about today, differ from Vanguard? Okay, so uh, we actually would be investing in some of the Vanguard products. Now, yeah. the difference is if you go to Vanguard, you're not getting, you're getting a Vanguard proposition. So you are going direct to Vanguard, who will only invest in Vanguard passive funds. Vanguard have got a great name. Um, we're not trying to compete. We're trying to support you guys and give you a route to market. Um, but yes, part of what Parmenian invests in will be Vanguard strategies. I guess the advantage, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Mike, is that uh, your system allows you to make your own portfolio using how you just said, ask your risk, your your priorities and stuff. And I'm not aware that Vanguard has something that advanced yet, they, but they obviously are one of the largest passive fund groups in the world. Is that right? Yeah, they are. And, and they've come to the UK as a um, as a, a direct to consumer proposition. So, um, you know, there are there are there is a place for everyone in this market and there's a need for every type of provider. But again, it's it's how you feel comfortable with it and whether you feel comfortable with do do. Are you getting the right support you need to make those right investment decisions or is it not quite the right proposition for you? And again, you know, as I said, it's horses for courses. It really depends on what you're trying to achieve. Um, Vanguard have some great strategies. We will use them. We use them in lots yeah. of portfolios uh, where we think it's right. So I guess the short answer is that Parminian will buy Vanguard funds. Uh, but if you use this Parminian product via you, Mike, and use, as you say, you run into any problems, you just phone that number, email that email, that email, and uh, you can either convert and you can also sort out the rest of your financial life, like your mortgage and your uh, income protection and stuff as well, which Vanguard won't offer. So yeah, uh, that's a good question though, Rachel. Hopefully that's covered it. I'm still scrolling. I, I think it's just while you're scrolling, it's it's about building long-term relationships with you and you know supporting you through that whole career trajectory. And as I said, there might be a point where you go, well, I've got 25, 30,000 pounds. Is now the right time to move across to a different service? Are there other needs or other things that need to be considered? Or, or can I continue with a Parminion or a, another platform? Um, again, always happy to have that chat. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, can you guys in the chat just do me a favor? And if you feel like I haven't answered your question, can you bump it up to the top? Uh, because I'm scrolling and I think uh, we've covered most things. And if we haven't covered it, like I said, the pensions, that is a massive topic. Check out our, our webinar on YouTube. And we hold regular pensions webinar. And tomorrow, is it Wednesday? Yeah, I know what day it is. Wednesday. I'm recording a three-part uh, NHS pensions podcast. So get on our podcast, get on our webinars, get on our mailing list. Um, I'll drop the link to get on our mailing list and I'll send you an email tomorrow. Uh, but I think uh, if there's uh, any... Oh, uh, Pranvi is asking, uh, do you have any advice for where to begin just as you leave medical school? First steps. Uh, first I guess step, she's talking about investments, right? Yeah, if you're talking about investments, which I, I hope you are, uh, basically it's just starting small, what you feel comfortable with, and it comes down to your budget. So I think the minimum on the Parminion is £50 a month. So start with £50 a month, see how you go, see how it grows or goes up and down, depending on how much risk you've taken, and then you get to, to basically do more if you wish um, and, and just basically build it up. So it might be you need to build your emergency pot up, you could do two. You, you could maybe build up the emergency fund at the same time as investing, or you might say, I'm going to build up the emergency fund first and then move on to investing. But basically, baby steps to start with. And then as your confidence grows and your comfort with investing grows, put some more in. Awesome. Um, Olivia is asking, which investment would have the fastest result? That's a big question oh, for this day in the webinar. <laughs> Might need a coffee before he answers that one. Uh, crystal ball, eh? I, I really can't answer that. It's, yeah. it's a really tough call. Crystal um, ball situation. Really yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess Tim, what you said earlier, you know, the higher the risk, in theory, the higher the return. Um, but you know, that is a that is a ginormous question, Olivia. Um, I like it, but it's massive, especially for um, half past nine at night when I've been wearing PPE all day. My nose is like it's on fire. I don't know what's happened. Um, Vamshi is asking, where can I find out more about ethical investing? We have loads of ethical investing advice on our blog in the investment section. We have an investment ethical investment podcast coming out next tuesday so get tuned into our podcast um so that's a great place to start with ethical investing um matthew's saying are you going to make an app for the parminium product i think it's just like a i guess what he's asking is like you know when you're like on um another fund like i don't know hargreaves lansdown or whatever and you have an app um can you monitor your parminium portfolio from an app or do we just use that link up there you can use the link, but actually what you can probably, I think what will happen is you will have the access to the Parminion portal. So um, you can, a lot of these now are not necessarily apps. What they do is they're sort of, um, I'm trying to think what they're called, they're, they're active links. So you save that active link to sort of your desktop, which then on your phone, which will take you through to the Parminion app uh, or the Parminion website. So you will have access to Parminion through that site once you're up and running. Cool. Um... Beverly is asking, how does the percent fee, I'm assuming she's talking about for Parminion here, work? Does it depend on the amount invested? You touched on this earlier where you said that it was a maximum of 1%, but it might be lower if you've got a portfolio of mainly bonds or other low risk stuff. Yeah. So so in essence, what happens is the, the, the fee gets taken from the fund and um, it will be taken normally a month in arrears. So it will be up to 1% over a 12 month period. And that's the way it's worked out. You will also be told what it is in pounds, shillings and pence. Um, but in essence, it comes off the value of the investment, whether it goes up or down. So obviously everyone's got, uh, as some people call it, skin in the game. You know, everyone is involved in this process and want to try and give you the best return. And as a result, um, we live and die by what's going on with the markets. And obviously income is, is affected by that. Yeah. Uh, Shalma just sent me a private message, which I really appreciate. I did a podcast this week or last week with Rachel Morris, where we talked about more sort of personal and the relationship between uh, wellness and money. And uh, I was really nervous doing that one because it's quite a personal one. So Shalma's hmm. giving me, I appreciate your feedback, Shalma. I was really nervous about talking about that sort of stuff. But I think as doctors, we, we need to talk about money much more than we do. And that's what we're trying to do at Medics Money. Okay, I'm still scrolling. Uh, oh, here we go. Uh, someone sent me a private message. I guess that means um, they don't want me to say their name. Is a... Lisa or Lisa, the same as a cash ISA. Can you open a, a Lisa and a stocks and shares ISA in the same tax year? Good question. Okay, so the answer is yes. And you can have a cash Lisa as well as a stocks and shares Lisa. Ultimately, every tax year, you are entitled to save up to £20,000 into an ISA, whether that's stocks and shares ISA, cash ISA, cash Lisa, or stocks and shares Lisa. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, and I think that, that definitely answers Rebecca's uh, question as well, who's just asking about Lysa. And um, yeah, um, life begins at 40, but if you're over 40 and you haven't got a Lysa, that ship has sailed, right? Yeah, it has. But in answer to the question, I can see it. Is it worth doing a Lysa, given how much it ties up the funds? Depends on your objective. Again, I'm afraid. You know, yeah, if you yeah. need access shortly, don't go into a Lysa. If this is for when you look to retire, a license is great because the government's giving you free money. Who wouldn't want free money? Yeah. Uh, like you said earlier, investing is a super long term game. Uh, so, yeah, um, you're getting a lot of love in the comments, Mike. It seems like you have explained it really. I mean, I thought that was a great explanation of some really complex stuff. And um, the graphs I love as well, because doctors, we love in interpreting data. Um, Mikhail uh i don't think you have answered this one apologies we have do you have much choice of what companies you invest in through parminium uh in essence no because you are buying a predetermined strategy as to where it's going to invest and because we're mainly using passives we're going to be following an index which means you get a bit of everything that's within that index um it's quite interesting that there is a, a shift change in investments and it's the ESG movement. So it's not ethical investing, but it's certainly a move more towards environmental, sociological, uh, social and governance. 
And what we're finding things like, and this is becoming more and more mainstream. So what we will find is probably in a couple of years, most mainstream investing is certainly more, um, more of a nod towards doing the right thing, not just profits at all costs. So should Coca-Cola still be producing plastic bottles? Or should they be doing other ways of dealing with it? And there is a groundswell growing. And this has actually been prompted, promoted by the regulator. So, you know, our regulator has actually done something that's really, really useful and has made it that uh, companies and, and, and investors like you actually, for the first time, have an opportunity to make a difference. In the past, there was no point voting because it just felt like it was it was pointless. There's a real shift change and the new generation coming through, investing young supporting all want to invest in companies that are looking after their staff looking after the environment and are operating morally correctly so there's some it's something called a stewardship code and there is going to be real shift change so whilst at the moment in this low-cost solution you don't necessarily have access to ethical investing there will certainly be a route forward uh, more towards esg and unfortunately the reason why there isn't an ethical investment route at the moment is because the way to invest ethically is that you have to screen the companies you're working you're you're going to invest in and it's called negative screening so you might screen out tobacco companies you might screen out nuclear companies or arms companies but there's there's actual physical work in that so it's more difficult to hold passive investments in an ethical way an active investor would an active investment strategy would do that um, but there's a lot more manpower a lot more research and actually, sometimes you even get to the point where you look at it and say, well, the things I'm investing in, which are financials, such as banks, well, whilst on the face of it, they might seem ethical because they're not investing directly in arms. But who have they lent money to? What company are they making components that goes in a bomb? Who knows? So the tentacles, you know, you've got to think of it like an octopus. The tentacles just, just go everywhere. And, and it is really, really difficult to truly be ethical investing. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic, especially for doctors, because, uh, you know, some of us probably unwittingly hold tobacco companies as part of our portfolio because they're in the funds that we buy. Um, so, um, yeah, the podcast is coming out. I'm pretty sure it's next week. We've got some great ESG uh, stuff on the site as well. So have a look at that, because if anybody of all investors should be interested in investing ethically, in my opinion, it's doctors. Um, everyone's opinion might be different. Um, OK, uh, we could literally stay here all night answering questions, um, but then I would fall asleep on the school run tomorrow, um, which would not be ideal. So I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Mike, for your time and all of the effort that you've put into this presentation. We've been going through this for a long, long time. It doesn't just happen accidentally, this kind of thing. So and it's also way past your bedtime, I imagine. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much, Mike. Uh, your contact details are there. We dropped the links to contact Mike via Medics Money, so you can tell him exactly what you want. You can have a look at other doctors, uh, what they thought of him. Uh, you also display some guide prices on there as well. So we're just trying to increase that transparency of the of what we're doing here. So that's great. Um, yeah, you're getting loads of thanks in the chat, which I, I know you can read. If, uh, yeah, and, if you want to join our more webinars, make sure you're on our mailing list. Easiest way to do that is go up on the ebook. I think we're approaching 21,000 email subscribers now, which is great. Um, Mike, any parting words of wisdom or uh, are we done? I think it's just get started, start, yeah. start small, start steady yeah. and yeah. build yourself up. Um, and yeah, just just get out there and investing. And it's about timing, time in the market rather than trying to time the market. It's about longer term investing and making sure that you can ride out those highs and lows as you go. Through. Yeah. And uh, you've also written that article on our site, which is really a really great article. One of my favorite about um, why not to panic? And you explain these what time in the market means rather than timing the market. That is absolutely critical and a bit more. So definitely have a look at that on our blog um and uh great all right um well thanks so much Brilliant. everybody for being so interactive and um if there's anything that you want us to do just drop us an email um because we literally just do things in response so uh, another feature that we have coming on our podcast um is we've got a medics money subscriber one of you guys and we've taken their situation 
and we've got one of our financial advisors, another financial advisor, sorry, Mike, uh, <laughs> to go through their scenario to show you what people like Mike do to help you make better financial decisions. So keep an eye on the podcast, keep an eye on our webinars. It was great to have you all. And uh, I'm going to sign off by saying a good night and have a good day at work tomorrow. I hope it's kind on you. I know how difficult work is at the moment because I've been there all day. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Take care, everybody. Thanks for having me. Cheers. Cheers, Mike. Take care.